peacekeepers in Bosnia. The British Army has been here for more than a decade through one of the bloodiest civil wars of the last century. They are part of the multinational NATO force, S4. Their job, to stop a new outbreak of war. Every six months, a fresh regiment arrives. For the first time, the British Army has allowed cameras to follow its Bosnian peacekeepers in action. Today, the Royal Scots launch a major house-to-house -house search for illegal weapons in the still-divided city of Banja Luka. The peacekeeper's biggest weapons find comes on a surprise visit to a local police station. And this is what the army means by putting weapons beyond use. Banja Luka, the British Army's main base in Bosnia. Today, the Royal Scots are on an Operation Harbinger, a major search for illegal weapons. A quarter of a million people were killed in the civil war. Hatred and fear is part of life here, and Bosnia is still a gun culture. Um, there's been rumours that the locals on each side of the river have been throwing grenades and shooting each other from across the river, but these are just rumours just now. Um, we've not actually caught anybody, so fingers crossed that we, we find something today. The peacekeepers are heading for a suburb of Banja Luka on the banks of the river Verbas. The Serbs live on one side of the river and the Muslims on the other. The troops need to nip in the bud any signs of potential conflict. Today their goal is to make a thorough search of the area and confiscate any illegal weapons. I think we uh, might be crossing the bridge. So basically just waiting to get a brief from the, the boss man, see what's happening. The Royal Scots plan to search every single house in the area. Accompanying them are members of the explosives team, in case any mines are found, and two sniffer dogs, specially trained to find hidden weapons. Sean and his team are given the Muslim side of the river to search. So she lives alone and she's got nothing. She's a returnee and she came back here three months ago uh -huh. uh, to the in Austria. She's got no males here. Would, would she mind if we still check the buildings? The yeah, houses and whatever? You can search all the houses in The Royal Scots have around 400 houses to search. It's almost impossible to rid Bosnia altogether of illegal weapons. They're cheap and easy to obtain, and many Bosnians just don't feel safe without them. It's basically all just uh, fabric. Those weapons getting fired from the other side. Firing fire as well. Yeah, they're firing from the other side to over here. Can you just ask her about it? Uh, where is she? She's just in there. Hey. We just. Cat, have you. She's dead, yes. She's dead. 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 She's dead.
How often does a fire? Kako često se dešava da 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 puca na drugoj strani? Kad ovaj slavu, kad im neka njihova Kada, kada doing some drago. celebrations like pa ja. feasts, weddings, pa ja. Christmas, to puca, Easter, to puca i rifles, da... and they fire from pa ja. automatic rifles, pistols. Pa ja. Do you know of any weapons and munitions over this side? Do you know of anybody who may have to do it? No, she doesn't know. Ja nisam... She feels threatened because it's also coming from there and over her house. Um, I mean, when they're firing um, bullets up into the air, they've got to come down somewhere. So, I mean, it does frighten the, the people over, the, over this side. It's obvious to the British troops that the Muslims here are very nervous. Their fear is that if the peacekeepers leave, civil war may break out again. Because it's Muslim area, um, uh, when the war was on, they basically got, uh, during the war, they got decommissioned by the Serbs and all the weapons got taken off them and they all got uh, thrown out of the town and this is some of them that have either been able to stay or just moved back. So far no illegal weapons have been found on the Muslim side of the river but every house has to be searched just in case. The army also hopes that regular searches may deter anyone thinking of buying an illegal weapon. Back in Banja Luka in a warehouse on the British base, the Light Dragoons are cataloguing the results of their latest weapons search. On a visit to a Serb police station, they came across this extraordinary hall. Definitely not. 7-5-7. We had a meeting the other day with some of the police. Um, and it turned out that they had uh, several cellars uh, full of weaponry which had been um, handed in or been confiscated at various times in the past for allegedly uh, investigation. Now, a lot of this weaponry is actually very old and quite obviously not being used in investigation sitting around. So what we did is we did a search of the police station with, I have to say, their cooperation. And we even had the chief of police helping us break down one door which he couldn't find the keys for. And during the course of it, we came across quite a lot of shotguns, some rifles, and a very large collection of pistols. So we've, what we've done is we've confiscated them now. Sometimes we have some slight suspicions that the odd policeman would rather we didn't come across some, some of the weaponry he had. Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Once they've been catalogued, the weapons have to be carefully dismantled. The parts must then be destroyed so that they cannot be used again or recycled. It's a slow and painstaking task. The first stage is to remove all the wood and leather. Then the metal components will be dismantled. And finally, the bodies of the weapons will be melted down using welding equipment. I'm sure there are some people out there who um, suspect or would like like the war to kick off again because profiteers made a lot of money in the war, there were criminal elements. Um, they, they might well be actively trying to hide weaponry, but the, the vast majority of the people, um, they have a weapon because that's what a man used to, used to, used to always have. It's as normal to have a rifle as it was to have a, a walking stick in your house. The army's rules require that every weapon is catalogued before it can be destroyed. With so many different types of weapon, and many very old ones, the cataloguing is not easy. I thought the serial number was on the, like, the front of the stock sort of thing. Yeah, where the book, uh... Where the book? You read it the opposite side. And all the shit. For the soldiers, it's a chance to handle weapons they've never seen before, some of them dating back to the Second World War. This is a 
a general purpose type machine gun and this is based on a, a German design very much like the uh, bolt action rifles. Uh, the actual design um, came out in 1942 um, and it hasn't changed since then. It's one of the first machine guns to where you could change the barrel within seconds so you could keep firing rounds rather than the barrel heating up and damaging itself with the uh, heat and passage of the rounds. You could actually change the barrel as it got hotter so it means you could fire more rounds. But this, this thing will fire um, between four and 600 rounds a minute. So you were talking about taking out a village. Um, this is, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. My gun's bigger than your gun. And I haven't seen many of these over here at all. This is um, quite unusual to see. And obviously, unless you were firing at a herd of deer, there's no way you can consider this as a hunting weapon. So uh, definitely military. Gas torches are used to break down the metal bodies of the weapons to ensure they can never be used again. For the soldiers, um, it's finds like this which actually make their day. It gives them something tangible they can go away with and say, we've done. And I think it's very exciting. They've enjoyed it the last couple of days. And they're enjoying searching through them at the moment and uh, counting what we've got. After the break, Will the peacekeepers find more illegal weapons when they cross over to the Serbian side of the river? And is this a hunting or a military rifle? The Royal Scots must decide. Back on Operation Harbinger, the Royal Scots are searching for weapons in the divided city of Banja Luka. They're still on the Muslim side of the river, where there have been no finds so far. This man declares that he has a hunting rifle, but the troops still want to search the premises. They start outside, because outhouses are a favourite place for keeping weapons. <laughs> Can you place that down on the ground and open it first, please? The peacekeepers find a hall of grenades. The man tells them they're not his. He claims to have come across them in some woods nearby. Well, that's his story. So, do we count them into here, please? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, eight, nine. Okay. Right, can we go outside for a quick chat? What do we get? I tell you, D, go on the right, ask Kilo 30 to come to the same location of work but drive further uphill. <coughs> right, uh, just to explain, obviously, now we've found this, uh, we've got to be it would be in our interest to search his house and the rest of the buildings. On kaže još samo želi da pogleda malo u u kuću i tako u ove ostale zgradice a uz vaše prisustvo. Not a problem. Well, he's already said that he, he found them in the forest under a tree. And obviously, he's, he's probably not telling us the truth there, but uh, we've got to take it as word. I'll wait in your day then. We'll crack on the, the search. Just run, This is where you normally find stuff in people's garages and huts. And they just got boxes of stuff left over for the war. And you open it up, or they'll quite happily take you there and show you it. And there's mortar bombs and all sorts of stuff. For left over for the war. Having found the grenades outside, the troops now want to search the inside of the house. The family living here are Serbs. They have a hunting rifle for which they say they have a permit. The shot's it clear first for they start? I just told him to put it in the ground, but yeah, it's clear. Yeah. Right, I'll yeah. Right. Happy with the permit. Serial number 18514. 
Да. 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 It's, this is a class of hunting rifles, so it's, we're quite happy for them to keep this as well. Although it's a large caliber, 7.9mm, there's a kiloman at a fair distance, but that's class of hunting rifle. But he didn't tell you you've got this, did he? No, obviously, as, as further as the search is going on, we're finding more and more. So. <laughs> You get the grenades, eh? Did the, anybody do people for them? He, he's a Muslim area, but he's a refugee. Yeah. Now, obviously, after the war, they've all fled from their own, own original homes. He's, he comes from Bogoino, which is in Federation. Now he lives here, but he's now occupying someone else's house. So he's probably going to be evicted in the future. Mm -hmm. He's, he's had enough of this this kind of living because this is this is not his house. Psychically the man is just overloaded. He can't take any more. On the Serbian side of the river, the peacekeepers have been finding a lot of weapons. Tango's either set rep from Tango 3-1. EOD disposed the 130mm armour piercing shell. He's got a Hungarian AK, M70 variant, and another M48. Dog now on task, call sign Tango 3 2. Over. Well, we found lots of Kalashnikovs in lots of houses today, but this is the most recent one that we just found a few minutes ago, yeah. Invariably, the, the the, the people will say they don't have it. They want to hang on to it for, for worst case scenario. Um... The army's sniffer dogs, two Springer Spaniels, are on standby. They're specially trained for weapon searches and said to be worth around £50,000 each. These weapons, automatic rifles and magazines, have just been found. So one of the dogs, Toby, will be called in to search the rest of the property. At the moment, uh, the search dog, um, ammunition and explosive search dog, is searching in this out outbuilding, which is part of this property. As the dog goes through the search procedure, if it indicates, and the handler will let us know, you know, its level of indication, could be minor to major, then he'll just, we'll just ferry troops to search the locality that's immediate to its indication. Right Is he declared or non-declared? Is he non-declared? Is he no, non -declared. nothing? The sniffer dogs are trained to smell out hidden weapons. If they find something suspicious, they must not retrieve it, as it may be an unexploded mine. They're taught to sit and wait by the find. <laughs> The old man says he'd forgotten about these weapons. They belonged to his son, who was killed during the Civil War. Since there's an unexploded shell round, Lee decides he must call in the explosives team to check it out. George Axel. Right, do you want to just dress back? I need to get you back out of here. Clear these, clear these kids doing the bottom of the helmet, would you? Right, stop that. There's a 20 millimeter um, shell in there, if you like, round, and we just need to clear people away from it. We're going to get the EOD back up. They dispose of anything of that caliber. When you're doing this sort of stuff, um, and the kids are hanging about, it pretty much brings it home to you, you know? Because these kids could be in that back garden with those rifle pair grenades in an hour's time or two hours' time. Well, they, who knows what they could do? They could just be unaware of their existence at all. And because they're in an unstable state, more than likely, then it's a hazard. It's been a good day's work for Toby. Yeah, today he's found uh, AK-47, uh, four magazines, 30 rounds, um, that up there. Uh, an M48, uh, a pistol. Um, I think that's about it for today. Yeah.
So you're quite proud of him today, are you? He's been good today, yeah. He's good every day, but <laughs> if the kid's there, hopefully he'll find it, so... The explosives team have now checked out the shell round. Thanks a lot. What are you, what are you going to do with it? Um, Let's take, take it back to Banja Luka, um, where we've got a store, and it'll get stored there for a week or so, and then we'll take it down to the range when uh, there's lots of them, and then we can get rid of them all in one go. So it's safe enough to move now? Yeah, it is, yeah. Right. It's taking away an explosive shell. This, they don't really want... Um, it's not in a stable state at this moment in time, so they just want to get it away from here and, uh, and deal with it. A tango, the 3 0 Roger, that's already happened. 3 2 will come up there shortly. Uh, I'm, I'm co located with them. I'll get a face to face with them. Over. It's important for the peacekeepers to be as visible as possible. They want the people of Bosnia to know that the world is watching and any outbreak of violence will be stopped and punished. Many of the locals find the troops' presence reassuring. Well, we were speaking to an older couple which was on the main road again, and they were saying that. If S4 were to leave, then it would all go back to the same thing. So they're quite happy to see us in and around the area. Um, because I asked them, what would, I mean, what do you think would happen if S4 were to leave? And they says, well, yeah, it would definitely go back to the same. Yeah, so, those, some of those old ladies, I mean, they were, yeah, I mean, just the way they Pretty spoke, frightened, but, yeah. yeah. They were frightened. Yeah. Because a lot of them do live alone around here, um, with their husbands either dying in the war or before or whatever. Operation Harbinger has lasted six hours and the men have searched around 400 houses. It's been a good day's weapons harvesting. But the challenge for the peacekeepers is stopping the weapons from flooding back in to this divided city. Well done, it's a very successful day. Found nine long barrel weapons, three pistols and uh, numerous amounts of ordnance, including some plastic explosive. So, your day's efforts have not been in vain. Is everyone happy? Right, that's it, guys. So, under your NCOs, we're going to get these things in the wagon, and the wagons, and then we're going to go back to respectful locations. OK? Today, the peacekeeper medics prepare for a simulated emergency, an exercise in which a helicopter is supposed to have crashed. Abdominal wound, P1. 16 soldiers are reported injured, at least one critically. And to amputate or not, the life and death decisions the medics face up to. Sipovo Hospital in central Bosnia, the main medical facility for the British troops. It's purpose-built, with two operating theatres and three helicopter landing pads, open 24 hours a day. Above all, it has to be ready to deal with full-scale emergencies. So, Nick, what's actually going on? Uh, I've just been paged. Uh, I don't know what it is yet. We're heading to the ops room to get a brief, and uh, from there, I'll go on to, to brief the team, and uh, we can take off. Uh, it could be anything from uh, my strike up to a, a road traffic accident. So uh, we're unsure at the moment. How much time have you got? Um, well, I'm supposed to get off the ground within about 20 minutes. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> quickly. Captain Moore is the first to discover the brief for today's exercise, codenamed Blue Light. It's his job to pass it on to the medical team on duty and organise helicopters with medics on board to recover the dummy casualties. Right, good afternoon. Um, the RT brief for the, this afternoon. This is an exercise. However, uh, the exercise is to be a helicopter crash at the Banyan Metal Factory helipad. There are 16 casualties. Priority is unknown, although it's a fuel explosion. I don't know if there are any are trapped, but the fire service at Banyan Metal Factory are dealing with, so not taking the firemen. The only people going are the EOD and the medical team. More than likely, we'll be coming back here with the first casualties and other helicopter assets will be tasked to deliver to other hospitals in the area. No, 
In a real emergency, the hospital can call on a team of 47 fully trained doctors, nurses and anaesthetists, British, Canadian and Dutch. The three nationalities have to learn to work together. That's what peacekeeping and exercises like this are all about. One of the main aims of today's training is for the medics to learn to grade the casualties so that the seriously injured can be treated first. Those needing emergency surgery are designated priority one, P1s. The less seriously injured are P2s. So this here is our priority two casualty area. This is where we treat uh, patients in a two-person team, a nurse and a healthcare support worker, with those casualties who would be needing to go to surgery within six hours. So you can see we have six different bays and they're marked out on the floor with the mine tape. Uh, three are always set up and then we, we set another three up as, as the situation dictates. In here then, excuse me, in here then we just have our, this is our number one operating theatre. So this is the primary theatre that we would use for all uh, casualties. It has the, the raised ceiling and the airflow, the negative, uh, negative airflow, which uh, makes it similar to a theatre back home that you'd see in the UK. So this then is our intensive care ward. We have the two intensive, pair, intensive care beds with ventilators and we have two high dependency beds which do not have the ventilators for a total of four beds. And then this then is our general ward. Um, so this is where we have all our low dependency patients. We always have uh, eight beds set up and we can expand up to 20 beds. So I think right now we have two patients in-house, one local uh, Bosnian lady and one S4 soldier. The helicopters have soldiers playing the injured on board and are on their way back to the hospital, but there's still little information on the casualties. So once we know what kind of casualties we have to deal with, obviously you can check them out. If we know we're going to have any air evac requirements, that's obviously their priority. But until then, if I could ask you to go and assist Bastille and Parish in setting up the P3 area. Tanya finds out more about the casualties. There's at least one P1, a critically injured patient. P1 is very badly injured who needs immediate surgery and resuscitation. P2 are the cases where you can wait for some time, and the wait for some time, when I say it's about two to three hours. Um, how is that? P1 casualty is heart and lung compromise that requires life-saving surgery within one hour. Those are kind of the NATO guidelines. P2 are those patients that don't have any heart or lung problems that require surgery within six hours. P3s are your walking wounded and P4 are your expectants, so those patients that may not make it. And what's wrong with this one, the P1? What's we actually wrong? We don't know yet, we just, but that gives us an idea of the different categories about how we should gear we up. We don't know what's wrong with them. We, they say that it is P2, there are three patients really. Maybe there are four, maybe there is only one. Only one. The situation will change. They may think that this is a P2 casualty who's coming in over here, but by the time he reaches over here, or she reaches over here, it will be P1. We'll change the priority and we'll deal with it. We can take upwards of 20 casualties. Um, normally that would be two P1s, six P2s, and the remainder P3s. We only have one anaesthetist in-house today, so that limits us to one P1 today. Um, but depending on the makeup of casualties, certainly we could accept the 16 casualties with the one limitation of only having one priority one. First person comes to me, second so here. He, so if they're not critical yeah. and yours is critical, then we move it to you, okay? But because we are the first we'll ones. Yeah. We, we have no blankets, so we're going to take some more. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to put down the rest of I have both the ALO and the assistant anyway, so. The most seriously injured patients come to the hospital's resuscitation department. In a real emergency, there may be dozens of injured and nowhere near enough time to treat them all. So the initial assessments are crucial. You got re ring elected. Okay, very good. That's, very good. That's fine. Yeah. I'm the A and E trained nurse within this department, so I run the resource department here along with Trevor. So you're going to be running around like mad in this? Yes. Minutes, so. Yes. This is what I do at home. So this is my bread and butter. I work in accident emergency at home, so I feel quite comfortable here. We deal with injuries that you wouldn't normally see back in the UK. I'm a personnel carrier sitting mines. Uh, that doesn't happen in uh, downtown London or downtown Ottawa. Um, uh, so when things go wrong, it goes wrong on a larger scale than it does on Civilian Street. All right, if I could have everyone's attention, please. We just got some more casualty information. 
So inbound on a helicopter right now with an ETA of less than 20 minutes, more like 15 minutes, we have six casualties. Uh, five of them are classified as P2 right now. The injuries are an abdominal wound, which is stable, an open leg wound, an arm amputation, which is stable, an open arm fracture, and an open wrist fracture. We also have one casualty classified as P1 at this stage from the field triage, and the injury, they're uncertain of the mechanism of injury. As the helicopters arrive, the medics are aware that they need to make their own assessments of the casualties as quickly as possible. The information they've received may be wrong, or some patients may have deteriorated en route to the hospital. The first priority is to deal with the critically injured P1 patient. The roles of the injured are played by other soldiers. That blood pressure is 80 over 60 at the moment. Okay. That is a P abdominal wound, P1. P1. After the break, difficult decisions for the surgeons. Should they amputate or not? Yeah, we normally we cut the laces off, right? So in real life. Yeah. And find out why, in the heat of battle, the most seriously injured may not be treated at all. I'm afraid warfare is a bit brutal, and, and people do uh, suffer injuries, which we know from experience that whatever we do, are unlikely to survive. At Sipovo Hospital in central Bosnia, an emergency exercise codenamed Blue Light is in full swing. It's simulating the aftermath of a helicopter crash in which 16 people have been injured. On arrival, the casualties are assessed to allow the most serious to be treated first. At least one is critical, a patient with an abdominal wound. One of the team assessing him is the hospital's British anaesthetist, Lieutenant Colonel Julian Richards. Uh, no chest injuries, uh, respiration is shallow and rapid. Can't, but I think can't he is like lost. That, can't actually like that. He needs more fluid and blood. Okay, let's get oxygen on, please. Monitors as well. To help expose the patient. I'll, I'll, I'll do the monitors. You do the upper area. Let me join. That'd be great. Okay. Heart rate's 115. Blood can pressure I, is 80 you? over 60. Covered. Is that your belt, mate? Is it? Is that your belt? It's in the cupboard in the corner. In the storage room. Once we expose the patient, we'll get two large bore IVs, please. One in each AC. He's got two IVs in at the moment. Great. Right. So. That's it. It was a helicopter crash, obviously. Uh, there's somebody must have had a penetrating wound from part, crash part of the helicopter into his belly. He's got guts uh, protruding. Uh, Blood pressure 137 over 60. In real life, prioritising patients can be rather brutal. Here, in, in a war situation, you haven't got ideal situations. Uh, you've got to do the most you can for the most people uh, who are likely to have a good quality of survival. And you prioritise those into P1. These are people who really need urgent, life-saving procedures instantly. P2 are people who can wait for a little while. Uh, and P3 are those which really have minor type of injury. But there are going to be people who have very major injuries, which experience says to us are very likely to die irrespective of what you do to them. And if you concentrate all your energies and all your relatively limited facilities on trying to save their lives, it may be, if you're not careful, at the cost of one or more people who would have a better chance of survival and a better quality of survival. So these people are uh, designated what we call P1 hold, which is an urgent situation, but will await our ability when we've dealt with the more serious cases who are likely to survive. Isn't they that will a bit wait brutal? I'm afraid warfare is a bit brutal, uh, and people do 
uh, suffer injuries which we know from experience that whatever we do are unlikely to survive. One patient, a P2, has a badly damaged right arm which may need to be amputated. Along with all those things, actually make sure that he is not really becoming a real injury of the cold. With the help of makeup, the fake injuries can look extremely realistic. Have an operation to make it better. Okay. We'll look after now. We'll get you nice and warm. And it doesn't look like anything else is hurt. All right. Yeah. We normally we cut the laces off, right? So in real life, I do it a lot more than that. Splint the limb and check the pulses everywhere. No other injuries or anything wrong with you? Were you conscious when you had the injury? You have never been unconscious at any stage? No headache? No pain in the chest? No pain in the abdomen? What about any pain around here? From the knee. Just at the knee. We're going to clean your hands up. We're going to go ahead and we would take your watch off and everything for swelling because you're probably going to have some swelling there. We're going to clean those up and just bandage them with some moist bandages. Okay. So we're going to do that with both hands. Wouldn't he be screaming if this was for real? He, I would think he would. I just asked him if he needed anything for pain. He's remarkably doing very well. He's even managing to chew gum. Yeah, I, it's uh, for real. Don't it's, choke on that because then we'll have an uh, airway problem and you don't so. want to go through that. <laughs> no, no. The soldier with the supposed injured arm is being constantly monitored in case his condition deteriorates. Do you remember everything what happened there? I remember that the medic came to get me. Just, All right. just, just relax. I'm just going to lift your head up. There's no headache or anything like that when no. I move this? No. Sideways? No? no? Okay. Check his blood pressure and everything else, really. Have a continuous blood pressure on him? Mm -hmm. Sir. Uh, somebody find my arm. Sir? Somebody find my arm. Yes, we will. Okay. We will. <laughs> okay, you're going to be fine. Thank you. Oh, any pain here when I press? Oh. No. The doctors decide that this patient needs an immediate operation. Take his boots off. Check his leg. The soldier with the abdominal injury has stabilized. His blood pressure is now under control and his x-rays have come back. I don't see any foreign bodies in the abdomen, Dr. White. Anybody? Okay, so chest x-ray is good, abdomen film is good, and pelvis is good. Okay. At the moment, we've got one in theater who's uh, bleeding heavily from his amputated arm and he was going to lose it if we didn't go stop it. So we'll stop that bleeding, which is just a primary treatment. We can tidy up the arm at a later date. We've just got to turn the tap on. He'll then come out of theatre and he becomes P2. Okay, do you want this, this gentleman no, held in P1? Uh, just hold yeah, him in P1? Yeah. I'd go, when, when they finish in theatre with the arm, they can take that one to theatre. Uh, and then following that, we we'll probably get any more. This girl's next, because she's got a lost radial pulse. But at the moment, I've got, I've got an eye on one, two, and three for theatre. I know which ones are going and in what order. OK. In the operating theatre, the soldier with the injured arm is now being treated. And this fellow, who had a traumatic amputation of the arm, he started an arterial bleed. He went down pretty quickly. Uh, he's been uh, uh, given him some anaesthetic drugs. He's on the anaesthetic machine here. Uh, and the so surgeon is notionally doing a uh, amputation uh, and controlling the bleeding. Uh, so when that is all done, it's only be uh, the very important things of it is stopping the blood first and doing a crude amputation. Any cosmetic surgery and improvement of the stump can be done at a later stage. Because we've got other patients waiting to come to theatre, we can't spend too much time doing careful 
stitching, making it all look nice, etc. The soldiers playing the part of casualties are in fact Dutch medics. We did, we're a group from the Dutch battle group in, uh, <laughs> thank you, in Nova <laughs> Travenik, and we're medics. Most of us are medics ourselves, so we do this yeah, very often. Do you quite enjoy it? I do, yeah, because um, during the process, you learn a lot yourself. You know, you see um, all stages uh, of help in the beginning till now uh, in the ward, and that's, yeah, you learn a lot of that. You know what it's like to be a patient, I suppose. Well, I would like to stand on that side. <laughs> that's better, but uh, no, it's, it's just what I said. It's, you learn a lot of this. Now that exercise blue light is winding down, the hospital chief, Colonel Sahi, can attend to his real patients. One is a Bosnian woman, a former textile worker who has a terminal respiratory disease. She's been referred here by her local doctor. Although chronic patients shouldn't really be treated here, Colonel Sahi finds it hard to turn them away. Um, Bruno, ask her is she happy to go home? Peter, what you Yeah, she likes it. Uh, she's asking if she can be prescribed some, and, but at the same time she's worried about getting the same one in the local pharmacies. Um, the tablets which I'm going to prescribe you, those are available here in, in, in the pharmacy outside in the city. Um, before I discharge her from the hospital, I have to think about whether she can really buy the medicine outside and if the medicine is really available in the local pharmacy. So before I write down a prescription for her, I'll have to take into consideration all those things really. Now who's going to look after her when she goes home? Well, to just to surprise you, she is the lady who's been looking after her husband who's in, who has some sort of disability really. I really don't know how is she going to cope with this really. I will try and make contact with the local doctor and the local clinic and see whether they can help her. And what about social services here? Um, is there one? Here's your kidney and your liver. And that looks good. You don't abuse alcohol or anything like that? No, not on a normal basis. <laughs> the other real patient who needs attending to is a Dutch soldier. He has an abdominal pain which needs investigating. See, is your spleen. Exercise blue light is now officially over, and there are useful practical lessons to be learnt. Handover was okay for one big critical thing that uh, P.O. Taylor has brought up uh, a number of times as well as me, is that we can't x-ray through the stretchers. And the uh, recommendation um, that uh, she made that was instituted is that the patients are on blankets and that we transfer with the blankets and not the stretcher. So I think that's kind of important that uh, we can pass that on. The medics here readily admit that no exercise can ever fully prepare you for the horrific injuries and mayhem of war. After an adrenaline-filled day, it's time to unwind. The game is called crud, but the rules seem a bit sketchy. All you need, apparently, is two balls, a pool table, and a lot of enthusiasm. For the peacekeeper medics, it's work hard, play hard.